why does the human soul constantly, almost always, choose short-term gain or pleasure over long-term truth? We'll, we'll look at that this morning. But first, let's, let's pray. Father, you know our hearts. You've created us. You know us body, soul, and spirit. You've given us the mind of Christ through the saving grace so freely offered through your Son. And you've given us hearts of flesh in exchange for hearts of stone. So help us to learn this morning to understand, to know your good pleasure, and help us throughout this year and throughout all eternity to act on that. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to tell you this morning about what I've been reading and thinking and praying about in my own private devotional time for a couple of months now. And you're going to wonder why, if I've spent 10 weeks or whatever going over all this, I have a message for you that might not last 10 minutes. Call me a slow learner. And everyone here can learn more quickly. Uh, not that I've really learned what I've been studying, but I've tried. So we'll, we'll go over it, and we'll go over it in the way that I tend to view things. I think everyone knows that my first career was as an historian. Time is an artificial construct, right? God exists outside time, beyond time. With him there is no changing at all. He's the same as he was, the same as he is, the same as he will be. But we are different as his creatures. And he's set us in a world which changes moment to moment, season to season. Some of us might want to skip this cold season, but it's part of the changing in the world. And we all of us get older. I remember um, once speaking with my my cousin, I call her, she was actually my grandfather's cousin, Alice, Alice Parsons Charter, who was a strong Christian, um, lived in Berlin most of her life. She once, shortly before she died at 101, told me, Robbie, in my heart, I've always been 19. <laughs> so in some ways, we don't change, right? We have this image of ourselves, but in we have only to look at ourselves in the mirror to realize we, we do change. And individually, we change not simply in our being, our visible being, but in our hearts, our souls, our minds, our spirits. That's individually. But mankind as a whole, as the human race, we don't change. We haven't changed since the fall from grace with our ancestor Adam, untold millennia ago. We're the same. People change individually, but we don't change as humans, as a human race. So what the past can teach us is useful. We know a limited number of people ourselves, right? The dozens who are here now and online, we might know all of them. We might know all the hundreds in our, our village, or perhaps we'll know tens of thousands to some degree in our lives. But by knowing what has happened in the past, we can know many thousands, millions more, and we get an idea of what God had in mind when he created human beings, and what he had in mind when he came to offer us the renewal of heart and soul and spirit 2,000 years ago. So even though we do change individually. We are all of us in need of repentance and salvation because of original sin. What's original sin? Well, we remember that perhaps the couplet from the Bay Primer, the, one of the first books printed in the American colonies back almost 400 years ago. In Adam's fall, we sinned all. So each of us has inherited that sinful nature, that nas natural tendency towards sin because of what Adam and Eve did 
long, long, long ago. Remember, with God, there's no time. Everything is eternal present. Everything is eternity without turning, without shadow. As the prophet Jeremiah said, the heart is deceitfully wicked above all things and desperate, desperate, desperate. Who can know it? But the Lord says that he searches the mind and tries the heart. So we'll try to get a grasp of that this morning. We remember also what Paul wrote to the church gathered at Rome, probably a little less than 2,000 years ago, somewhere around about 50, 54 AD. He wrote that God forbears so that his goodness may lead us to repentance. He forbears from giving us the natural reward of our sinful nature and our sinful acts so that his goodness, the goodness of God, leads us to repentance. And how can that be? I mean, if we are all of us self-serving, self-seeking, and not deserving, not sought out, how can this be? Because we love, right? But why do we love? John wrote in one of his general letters, his first one, we love because he first loved us. Finally, before we leap into history in this eternal moment, remember also, let's remember what, um, what Paul wrote to the church gathered at Ephesus. He said to them, you've been saved by grace, and that's not your own grace, nor what grace that you deserve, because there is no basis for any person, any individual human being, to boast. You've been saved by grace, that not of yourselves, lest any man should boast. So here we are, we're looking at a pretty bad situation. The sinful creature deserves damnation, eternal death, or eternal separation from God. And yet we know that we won't have that. Why? Because of what Christ has done for us. Not because of what we do, but because of what he's done for us. So what's this repentance? What, what do the great men of the faith say about this? Let's talk a moment about the, the early church. The very first church was Jewish. The Messianic Jews were a sect of Judaism, just like the Essenes or the Sadducees or the Pharisees or any of a half dozen others that existed in Palestine and to some extent, small extent, elsewhere at the time that Jesus was born. And it continued to be Jews, Jewish, basically Jewish, for more than two or three generations thereafter. The big change came in 70 AD. The Jewish population of Palestine had risen in revolt against the Roman conquerors, and they were slowly conquered, reconquered by the Roman legions. Five legions eventually, about a quarter of the entire Roman army at the time. Huge empire, the largest empire the world had ever known to that extent, at that point, completely surrounding the Mediterranean. North Africa, the Near East, the Balkans, you know, Spain, what's now Spain, Portugal, Italy, France, even into Britain, everything was under Roman rule. But a huge portion of the army was concentrated in tiny little Palestine because the Jews had risen in revolt. Almost all of them had risen in revolt. You can imagine what happens with farmers armed with pitchforks or uh, palace guards armed with only swords, they were defeated, driven back. And the last major stronghold, we know about Masada, but the last major stronghold was Jerusalem. Why? Because the bulk of the population had gathered there as a last resort to defend the temple. At that time, at that time, all Jews except a couple of strange sects, the Messianic, Jews who were calling themselves the way, and the Essenes, 
are only, the only two remarkable sects that said God can be with us directly wherever we are. The rest, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the institutional sects said we need the temple. We need the temple for daily sacrifice. There's no way that God can be with us without the temple. So they gathered to protect the temple. The legions moved in. They began to, to lay siege to Jerusalem in, in April, in the spring of 70 AD, under Titus, a brilliant general who eventually became emperor, but a rather heartless general. So those people gathered in Jerusalem knew what would happen if they surrendered. All the more reason to fight on. Nevertheless, the walls were breached, and finally, at the end of August, the 30th of August, the Romans got so close to the temple that they were able to set it ablaze. And after Jerusalem was thoroughly subdued, they razed the temple. There's a remnant still. You know it is the Wailing Wall. But for the most part, there is nothing to be seen of the temple today. We don't know where the Ark of the Covenant is. Ethiopian faithful say that it's uh, at Tabora, but um, we don't really know that. And even having lived in Ethiopia, I can't tell you that it's there. I don't know. No one knows. But does that matter anymore? No, because of the indwelling spirit of the Lord within us. And that's because of what happened before Jerusalem fell. But this also changed the way. The way, the Messianic Jewish sect, became more open and it began to gather numerous adherents, not just Jews who were scattered in doing business in Rome or in Alexandria or Antioch, but Gentiles as well. And it began to change the attitude of those who were the leaders of the faith within the various churches gathered here, small groups of 10, 20, 15 people here or there. The Pharisees eventually became rabbinic Judaism without the sacrifice. So they did change tremendously, right? No, nobody offers sacrifice, no one whom I know, not my Jewish relatives, not my Jewish friends, nobody whom I know offers sacrifice today. But the way didn't have to worry about that because for them, the sacrifice was the Son of God once and for all, no more depending upon the blood of goats and sheep, but the goats of the only, the, the blood of the only pure and undefiled sacrifice. So what would suffice forever? With the change of the character of this group, though, from being a sect of Judaism to being a faith that encompasses all people, the influence of Greek philosophy became stronger and stronger. That was the determinative philosophy of the Roman world. We think of the Romans as the leaders in every way of their empire, but they weren't. They were the governors, they were the statesmen, they were the soldiers, they were the engineers, but philosophy and the arts were largely a product, even then, of Greece. And the Greeks can dispute, or could then dispute, philosophy without end. And in always inquiring for first source, first motive, first, 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 what lay behind, behind, behind. And finally, that began to penetrate into the church itself. The church kept reasonably pure, reasonably close to the word of God up until about 313, when the Edict of Milan was promulgated. That was the Edict of Toleration. No longer would Christians be tortured to death, executed, deprived of all their property, all sorts of other things happened to them if they failed to adhere to the state religion of wor worshiping Caesar. So this additional religion was allowed, and it began to attract adherents who weren't really interested in the, the substance of the faith, but rather the fellowship, the possible governmental preference if, in hiring, all sorts of other 
financial gains, so forth. And that in itself became even more extreme in 380 AD, the Edict of Thessalonica, which made Christianity the state religion. State religion. Sad to say, that always has tended to corrupt what passes for Christianity. And that happened here too. People began to infuse the faith with Greek philosophy and to seek preference within the faith for material gain. All of this led to a great deal of confusion and the first to announce a major uh, menace to the faith was a man named Pelagius. We don't know much about him. He might have been from Ireland, what's now Ireland, might have been from Britain. He was from the British Isles. He seems to have been a genuine believer, but with one troubled aspect of his theology. He believed that we cooperated with God in our salvation, that Christ's sacrifice wasn't sufficient, and that we could become perfect because of Christ's sacrifice, but also because of what we do, we can become perfect in this life. We all of us know from experience and from what we can see around us, that's simply not true. Simply not true. The best soccer player, and I'm thinking of that because Pele died this past week, the best soccer player wasn't perfect. The best musician isn't perfect. The best orator isn't perfect. The best at anything isn't perfect. There is no way that human beings can perfect themselves. And in fact, believing that there was no original sin, because Pelagius, influenced by Greek philosophy, had to go back to before, 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 to the first. Why do we sin? Well, it's because Adam sinned. No, he said, that's not so. Because we can become perfect without sin, so there's no original sin. Adam and Eve sinned, but that doesn't mean that I'm born into sin or am obliged to sin. We can attain perfection. We choose God. This, of course, shocked those who heard him and were believing Christians, including the man who is, I think, one of the two or three greatest of all Christian theologians ever, Aurelius Augustinus, whom we know better as Augustine. Augustine was amazed that anyone could believe this, even more amazed after he met Pelagius and believed him to be a Christian. How could he be so mistaken in such a foundational aspect of the faith that he could believe that we can attain perfection and even worse, that we can help to save ourselves? Well, it turned out that Pelagius had been in Rome in 410 when Alaric the Vandal sacked, uh, Visigoth, excuse me, the Vandals cooperated, but Alaric was a Visigoth, but he was a barbarian, when he and his tribesmen sacked Rome. And Pelagius believed that this was a sentence upon the sinful Romans, who all of them by this time, almost all of them, were declaring themselves to be Christians, but constantly engaged in prostitution, extortion, thievery, blasphemy, dishonesty of all kinds. So Pelagius believed that we have to cooperate with God for salvation because of the example he saw of merely nominal Christians or backslidden Christians. Sometimes you can't tell the difference between the two. So he believed that the moral laxity could be addressed by divine grace, but he didn't believe as Augustine, who became a Christian only as a man of 32 years, and was deeply troubled by his own sinfulness. Augustine believed that only irresistible grace can overcome our natural tendency to error, to sinfulness, to pridefulness, and to moral laxity. What about Augustine? We know a fair amount about him. He was born in 354 to possibly godly parents. Certainly his mother, Monica, was a believer. And she was praying constantly for the salvation of her son, who as he grew became more and more, not simply morally lax, but immorally defiant. 
Later in his life, he wrote something called his Confessions. And in that book, which is one of the great works of, of Western literature, he was, by the way, a North African, but at this time, Northern Africa was part of the West. It was long before Muhammad was born or the, uh, the Muslim advance had swept across Africa and up into what's now Spain. At this time, all of North Africa was at least nominally Christian. So, yes, Augustine grew up nominally Christian, but he, as many boys do, as some girls perhaps do, I don't know, I, I'm a, I was a boy, never was a girl, and uh, my brother was always a boy too, so I, I have no, nothing to go on this. But many boys do things that are not simply daredeviltry, but actually defiant of the moral code that God has laid out for us. His great concern was when he was just a boy of maybe 10 or 12, he had stolen a neighbor's fruit. Not because he was hungry, not because he wanted the fruit, but because he was excited and pleased by the act of theft itself. So 20 years later, he became a Christian and was haunted by this, haunted by this. He'd done other things too. He'd kept concubines, he'd deceived, he'd uh, done all sorts of things that troubled him. But most of all, what troubled him was this act of thievery as a boy because it was the act itself that pleased him at the time. And sin can be like that, right? Attractive in itself, not for the fortune or the pleasure that you gain from the sin, but the sinfulness itself can give many of us, or did give us, uh, a thrill, a pleasure. So Augustine came up against the Pelagian heresy. Pelagianism, though, is nothing that's been forgotten. We'll see its shadow in the present day. He came up against it with an idea that I think holds true even today. There is what we might call a virtuous triangle or virtuous cycle that we are bound by sin. Our minds are so darkened by the original sin which we did indeed inherit through that contradiction to the Lord's command in the Garden of Eden. We're so bound by that that, our, that we are shadows. We are creatures living in the shadows. We don't have freedom of the will. We have a will. God has given us a will which can direct our minds, our thoughts, our deeds, but it's inclined towards sin, oftentimes just for the mere thrill of the sin. And even if we know what is better, even if we might even hope or feel in our hearts what is better, we don't make the better choice. It's too difficult. Or, hey man, if it feels good, do it. You know, we've heard that a lot, right? Whatever it is, we tend always to choose what is wrong before our minds are enlightened by the light of Christ. And that comes only through irresistible grace, which then establishes us in faith, which nurtures virtue, which liberates us, gives us freedom. And as he wrote later in his other great work, City of God, the, or on the city of God against the pagans. Augustine clearly said that a society itself can be renewed as well because it's con constituted by Christians, by believers, who then can impart to the society itself a freedom that nurtures faith, that nurtures virtue, that feeds freedom. It's a cycle that is virtuous and continues between these three points, Lord willing, forever. Though Augustine knew because of the corruption of human nature, nothing lasts forever. Each generation must be saved anew. Each human being must be saved once and for all. And although at the time that he was speaking and writing, Augustine died only in 430 AD, 
The Roman Church, which was part of the Catholic Church at that time, there was an undivided church that called itself Catholic at that time. Later, the Roman part, the Western Church, began to slip further and further into sinfulness, decay, idolatry, and all sorts of other terrible ills. Again, because it became the state religion. At least that's my best guess. That's also the best guess of other historians who know more about it than I do. By the turn of the millennium, 1000 AD, 1000 AD, the split between the two halves of the Roman Empire, the Western Roman Empire had ceased to exist hundreds of years before. It decayed, but the Roman Church stayed fairly much intact. The split between East and West had gotten so far that there were mutual anathemas. The Patriarch of Constantinople, the chairman of the Eastern Church, the Orthodox Church, the Orthodox Catholic Church, it's now called, and the head of the Western Church, the ruler of the Western Church, the Patriarch of Rome, the Bishop of Rome, the Pope of Rome, as he's usually called today, had mutually cursed each other, calling each other a heretic and an error. And certainly, frankly, if you look at the record, the greater error was on the Western part, and partly because of its having been the institutional church of a decayed empire. So by, by 1000 AD, 600 years after Augustine wrote what was accepted by the church at that time, universally accepted as accurate, that we are inclined to sin and only irresistible grace can save us from that sinfulness, was no longer doctrine of the Roman Church as preached in medieval Europe. Instead, we accept, we chose to follow Christ because we chose of our own will to follow Christ. Pelagianism, perfectionism, self, self-sacrifice, self-salvation, all of it heretical. And it got to such a point in the West that there were numerous attempts to reform the, the Roman Church, the Western Church. Reform, form again on its original foundation, in its original shape. The Church as it was in 50 AD, 100 AD, 150 AD. Not the Church as it was in 1000 AD, 1100, 1200 AD. So for example, the attempt of the Waldensians in northern, what's now northern Italy, southern France. Later on, the attempt of the Cathars, the attempt of the Hussites, the attempt of the Wycliffeites. All of these attempts were met by a church that was determined to keep its rule intact, even declared a crusade against Christians, against the Cathars, who, whom we'd recognize as rather weird, but brothers and sisters in Christ, very Pentecostal, brothers and sisters in Christ. There was crusade. It was made something meritorious by decree from the Bishop of Rome to kill a Cathar for Christ. Terrible. Finally, there was a successful reformation. On the last day of October, 1513, a disillusioned and very distressed monk posted 95 theses on the door of the church of Wittenberg, Germany. 95 points in which he believed, having studied the Bible carefully, not in the course of his recent life, not even when he took the equivalent of a doctorate in theology, but afterward, points in which the Roman church erred. And these came down to several that were most important. He came out with what he called the five onlys, the five soli, only Christ, only grace, only faith, only Holy Scripture, the Bible, and to God alone, only God to be glorified. What concerns us most of all in this right now is sola scriptura, only 
the Bible, sole rule of faith. Not the lives of the saints, not the reasoning of man, even though we can be illumined by looking at the saints who have gone before us, we can be illumined by looking at nature and reasoning. God gave us minds for, for a reason. Thank goodness he's re renewed those minds, refreshed them, and given us the mind of Christ now. But it's only by grace that we are saved. Even our inclination to choose the salvation so freely offered to every human being, even our inclination to choose that instead of short-term self-pleasure comes from God's grace. John Calvin, who was born half generation after, after Luther and died almost 20 years after Luther, codified these into five different points. The total depravity, tulip, right? Total depravity of the human mind by itself, unrenewed, we always will seek what gives us pleasure, gives us satisfaction, not what satisfies the Lord. Not what we're called to be, but what we think we want. Unconditional election. God has chosen us. And having chosen us, we are to be saved. And having been saved, we do not fall from grace. Limited atonement, a sad point here, and one in which there is sometimes disagreement, that although Christ's sacrifice is sufficient for the salvation of all, in fact, not all will choose his sacrifice. Not all will call him Lord, Lord, with true heart. So only his sacrifice atones, therefore, only for some of human beings. Because only those who have chosen to follow him will be saved. Irresistible grace. You cannot deny the grace that God gives you once your heart and mind are illumined to receive that grace and perseverance of the saints. Having been saved, it's once saved, forever saved. You do not fall from grace, the great, greatest gift that God gives us. We know that all gifts of the Spirit are without repentance, right? Scripture tells us that. The greatest gift, of course, is salvation. So having been saved, we'll always be saved. And to the end of time, even if we sin, continue to sin as we do. I mean, Paul points out, wretched man that I am, who will save me from this body of sinfulness? But it will happen. And yet Pelagianism continued. Jacobus Arminius, the Latinized form of uh, Jakub Hermansun, if I remember correctly, a Dutchman who was a believing Christian, and who began as a very solid Calvinist, following those five points of Calvinism, the tulip, he believed that we can be called by Christ to himself and yet refuse to answer or simply rebuff him. No, Jesus, I don't accept your sacrifice. Now, he did say those people, of course, are not Christians, even if they go to church every Sunday or give uh, alms to the poor or or do other godly things. They're not Christians. He did realize that. But he did believe that grace is resistible. And that elicited remarks from the third person for me in my personal pantheon of, of great theologians, together with um, Augustine and John Calvin, Jonathan Edwards. And we come home to Connecticut for Jonathan Edwards. He was born in it's now East, uh, East Windsor in 1703. He's probably not only the greatest theologian that America's ever produced, but also one of the most brilliant men America's ever produced, interested in the sciences, in education, in arts and letters, interested in all sorts of things. In fact, he became briefly uh, president of what we now call Princeton University. I say briefly because one of his interests was medical advances. So he inoculated himself and died of the inoculation. <laughs> we won't talk about COVID vaccines right now. Okay. But he, as a very young minister, uh, 28 years old, 
preached in Boston that man is wholly dependent upon God. Wholly dependent. We can breathe and sustain this body only because of God's grace in the involuntary muscles of the, of the lungs. We can think, we can do, we can walk only because of God's grace, giving us minds that can direct the legs and, and feet and arms. But most importantly of all, we can accept that salvation, that saving grace, only because God has given us grace to resist the temptation of the body, of the selfish soul, to seek only pleasure. Augustine later wrote in his Confessions that before he became a Christian at 32, he became more and more drawn to Christianity, prayers of his mother, and of, of a friend of his also. So he began to pray, God, give me grace, save me, but not yet. You know, he wanted to do more of what pleased himself at that time. Jonathan Edwards, having had a, a godly upbringing, son of a minister, son of an extraordinary woman, uh, a brilliant and well-educated woman, very unusual uh, for women, even here in New England where women were educated in colonial times. He, he was, in fact, interestingly enough, he was prepared for university, not simply by his father, but by his older sisters because they were well-educated. So Jonathan Edwards, having grown up in the bosom of a Christian family, knew what it was like to be able to rebuff temptation. And even before he became a Christian, he was able to pray for protection against temptation, which is really good, really good. So here we are with Pelagianism on the one hand saying that we choose to follow Christ because we choose, not because God has given us grace to choose what is good and what is right. We've got Pelagianism saying we can become perfect in this world. Pelagius pointed out, you know, Scripture itself says, be perfect even as I am perfect. Well, that's not a time-limited admonition of the Lord's part, and clearly, I think, it, it tells us what will happen in future, not on this earth. We look around, we see that everyone is imperfect. You know, people who say man is naturally good are the very same people who say nobody's perfect, right? So we know there's no one perfect. We know from our own experience that man is not naturally inclined to the good, but rather is a battleground between good and evil. We not only are soldiers in that fight, we are the ground over which that fight is fought. So what do we do then? What do we do with, with all these disjointed and yet coordinated thoughts? We remember what Jesus said. It was recorded in John's Gospel. Without me, you can do nothing. Nothing. Choosing to follow Christ is not nothing. So clearly we need him through the Holy Spirit, so to incline our hearts that we choose him because of the grace already given to choose him. It's the goodness of God that leads us to repentance, as Paul wrote to the church gathered at Rome. And as he wrote to the church gathered at Ephesus, we are created in Christ Jesus for good works. But on the other hand, Peter wrote in his second general letter, God is not willing that any should perish. Now, willing there is translated from a Greek word which really means God does not oblige anyone to perish. But since God doesn't want people to perish, why do some perish? Well, I remember also that Paul wrote to his first preserved letter to the church at Corinth, probably not the first he ever wrote, that Jesus has opened for us a new and better way. He admonished the church gathered at Philippi to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, 
for God is at work within you to will and to do for his good pleasure. So all of this tells us that we are saved purely by grace. But when we remember that God does not want anyone to perish, how is it that some do refuse that grace? Is, is scripture contradicting, contradicting itself? We know that that cannot be. So how do we explain it? Well, that, my dear friends, is for another sermon. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit, the gift of your Son and his sacrifice, that we can approach you directly, that you've constituted us a kingdom of priests with but one high priest, the sole mediator between God and man, even the man Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, for this. We thank you for what you impart to us each day, whether through the gospel of your word, the gospel of your works, or the gospel of your spirit with dwelling within us, that we can draw closer and closer to you and finally, finally see you face to face. We remember as we do draw closer to you the words in that pattern prayer that you taught us saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done.